Well, welcome to another Monday night uh, reading with me. Uh, I'm going to be reading from Diet Amon's excellent uh, memoirs and um, letters called Things We Couldn't Say. This book is um, about uh, World War II. It's uh, the experience of uh, a couple who smuggled hundreds of Jews out of um, uh, the Netherlands. And um, read a little, little bit from the back here. Uh, to give you a, an idea of what the book is about. It says, Things We Couldn't Say is the inspiring true story of Diet Amon, a young Dutch woman who, with her fiancé, Hein Sietzma, risked everything to rescue imperiled Jews in Nazi-occupied Holland during World War II. Throughout the years that Diet and Hein aided the resistance, work that would cost Diet her freedom and Hein his life, their courageous effort ultimately saved the lives of hundreds of Dutch Jews, possessing all the emotional support, I'm sorry, all the emotional impact of the diary of Anne Frank and all the drama of the hiding place, Diet Amon's Things We Couldn't Say is an unforgettable story of heroism, faith, and above all, love. There are a few reviews in the back. I think one of them is worth reading. This is from the Jewish Chronicle. A splendidly uplifting account of heroism against the odds. Amon's story, including her own capture incarceration and interrogation at the hands of the Gestapo reads like a thriller of great emotional intensity, the latter provided through her love for her fiancé and fellow resistor, Hein, who does not survive capture and deportation to Germany, and her constant arguments with God. This is a life-affirming book. So I'm going to um, skip the first chapter, which is a little bit about her life before the war, and I'm going to open it up with chapter two, which is... Uh, the first chapter is not very long, but I think if I read both of them, it will take too long. So I'm just going to read from chapter two tonight. It is entitled, The Invasion. It was May 9, 1940, the Thursday night before Pentecost, when some friends were visiting my family in our home. We had the radio on and were listening to Hitler give one of his fine speeches. There were quite a few people in our house that night, and we all knew German. We heard Hitler say that the Netherlands did not have to fear because the Dutch had been neutral during the First World War and he would respect our neutrality. We were not important to his campaign, so he didn't have to, we didn't have to worry. After our guests had left, we all went to bed. But only a few hours later, I awoke to what I recognized as a familiar sound. It was the staccato sound of someone beating a rug. In the Netherlands of that era, housewives kept a regular weekly schedule. Monday was laundry day, Tuesday was for ironing, Wednesday you cleaned the living room, Thursday perhaps another room, and on Friday you cleaned the rugs with mountain cloppers, rug beaters. When I awoke very early that Friday morning, I immediately thought, this is crazy, some idiot is beating rugs right now and it's pitch dark outside. What I heard was the pop, 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 as if someone were spanking rugs, only much faster. It was the first sound of the war father and mother were up too. They had gone into the street in front of the house, so I joined them. There in the dark sky above us, we could see an air battle, planes and shooting. We could hear it too, of course, and we could see what was being shot at the planes from the ground, what they call flak. We all ran back into the house and turned the radio on. The broadcaster sounded very nervous. He told us that we were at war and that German paratroops had landed. This happened only hours after Hitler had assured us that we were in the Netherlands needn't worry. I don't think that I, I didn't think that I had ever been lied to by a government leader before that time, and I was furious that this liar had told us not to be worried at the very moment he was sending troops onto our soil. And our Dutch army, what were they? Our government did not believe in having a real standing army, and they certainly hadn't planned on this war. Our soldiers were on bicycles. Can you imagine? With their aging rifles slung over their shoulders, against the Germans, they were powerless. On top of that, many Germans came into the Netherlands that night wearing Dutch army uniforms. It had been reported from time to time in our papers that many Dutch uniforms had been missing, but no one had put two and two together. Not, at least, until those first Germans came over our borders, looking so much like our soldiers that our boys didn't even know whom to shoot at. Some Germans even invaded our country wearing priests' habits. We didn't sleep at all that night. After going back inside and listening to the radio reports, we talked and made tea. We were very nervous. 
Finally, we went back to bed to try to get an hour or so of rest. But there was no rest. We were at war. Yet the next day, what was there to do but go back to work? I had been working for some time at the Tevencia Bank, a very good bank in the center of The Hague. So that morning, I got on my bike as usual. I didn't worry about air bombardment or any kind of danger. I just went to work. My regular route was via Wandelstraat, a main artery into the city. At one point, I was stopped on that street by the Dutch police, who commanded me to say the words Schwenningen and Schappenscherder. By the way, my apologies. I did study German a bit in college, but um, I'm sure I'm butchering these anyway. To pronounce these words slowly, it was Schibleth. If you're a native speaker of Dutch, you could pronounce those words perfectly. Germans, however, could not. It was just hours after the initial attack, but there had already been so much infiltration into the country that those precautions had to be taken. There had been fighting on the outskirts of The Hague that morning, and paratroopers were all around the airports. Adrian, a young man who was then dating my sister Fanny, was in the service like Hein. He had taken a job that required a certain amount of time in the army. The deal he had signed up for was this. If he agreed to go into the military service, he would get a good government job once he got out. And his time in the service was almost over. Fanny and Adrian were planning to get married in September, four months from the time of the invasion. That night of May 9, Adrian was standing guard with his buddy at Yippenburg, the little airfield just outside The Hague, when, where the Germans dropped hundreds of paratroopers. He and his buddy were killed guarding that little airfield. They were among the very f first Dutch soldiers to die. On the 15th of May, 1940, the Netherlands surrendered. Hitler had assumed that he could take this little country with their bicycle soldiers within a day, but it took him five. The Dutch surrendered only because Hitler's bombers had destroyed Rotterdam. They had bombed the middle of the city, where all the people were, of course, and had destroyed hospitals and churches as well. It must have been horrible. I didn't know it then, but Hein had been transferred to Rotterdam before the bombing, and he saw the whole thing himself. I had thought all along that Hein was stationed in the east, in that area from Deventer to Aide. I had been worried about him, of course, because his first assignment was close to the German border and to much of the fighting. One weekend, Hein had asked me to come to Aide, and I had ridden up there on my bike. He had borrowed a motorbike from a friend, and we traveled on it for miles, even though I was scared stiff the whole time. But he was happy to be away from the military environment for a while. I never liked the military. Something in him just seemed to hate it. It struck him, he told me, that so much of what happened in military life was simply a waste of time. It was difficult for him to serve his time, even before the war, but it was not because he was unpatriotic. What he did during the rest of the occupation showed his patriotism, without a doubt. But he felt strange about the kind of life that was expected of him if he wanted to be a good soldier. December 9, 1939. I long so much to be a civilian again. I have to force myself to do my duty. I don't have the authority that I should have without making myself fierce so that the guys are scared of me. Maybe I allow them too much. I don't have enough knowledge of human nature. I am too easygoing. I always watch what the others, colleagues, do wrong and never want to do anything more than they are doing. I am an egotist. I always have to force myself to realize that it does not matter that I, again and again, struggle with empty service time, with exercises which are not worth a thing, with turns of duty which are worth nothing. I have to remember that it is much more important to be always on time, to create more action, and this way to stimulate the other guys to do well. I have to live more for guys and service as one concept. My looking at the faults of others has to disappear. In the first place, I have to love, for Christ rules and he has conquered all. December 25, 1939. A soldier at the cross, Christmas and the war, sweating and Christmas leave, the song of the angels and street jokes. The little child in the manger is the Christ of the cross. The true Christmas spirit makes us see him as our king and redeemer. My will subordinate, subordinate to his will. Away with slander, away with egotism, away with gossip, away with thinking evil, away with doing evil. If we Christians get rid of all our faults and errors, we still have to look to help others, for true love for God reveals itself in love for your neighbor. We should not seek ourselves or boast of what we do because we have no merit. He first took away our sins and then he fulfilled obedience for us. First he made us Adams in paradise and then he fulfilled the covenant so that we, because of him, 
may go to heaven as redeemed. Where is my gratitude? In comparison, for his gift, what are these little things I am going through? From the journal of Hein Sitzma. In the first few days of the invasion, I was terribly worried because of the rumors and radio reports, while we still had them, of heavy fighting at the Gredenberg. Grebeberg. Our government had been blown had even blown up some dikes and dams to inundate the land. I thought constantly of Hein and tried to write him daily. Because there were so many spies throughout the country, the government would not forward closed letters, only postcards which could be read easily. So for a time, I wrote Hein a postcard every day, not knowing where he was or whether or not he'd been harmed by the invasion and the fighting that followed. From The Hague, May 12, 1940. Dearest, you probably haven't received my letters, but you know they're always that we are always praying for you and our boys. We're not afraid because you're in the Father's hands where you're safe. We don't see him, but he is with us. He himself promised us that, and he will certainly do it in the hour of danger. He has found this necessary for us, and through it he brings us very close to him. There, it is good, isn't it? How thankful I am that we were able to see each other last week and that I was able to be with you. I keep thinking back to our Easter holidays. Today it is Pentecost. The Lord remains the same. He is the rock upon which we lean. He hears all our prayers and answers them in the way that he finds best for us. He never makes mistakes. Till we meet again, dearest, here or there, where there is no more sorrow, you are fighting with God for justice. Don't ever worry about me, okay? A kiss from your Diet. Posted from Diet Amon to Hein Seidma. Already in the early months of 1940, the government had moved the soldiers around because they were beginning to feel the Nazi threat acutely. So it wasn't until I heard from Hein after the invasion that I realized he had not been at aid at all when the invasion took place. Instead, he'd been moved to Rotterdam, where he had witnessed the terrible bombing of that old, beautiful city. June 4, 1940. Pentecost I could not celebrate. War of five days, and we were conquered. Bitter I have been. Hate I felt. Courage, for I did not shrink from death. Only Diet was there because of her I still was careful. I have been in the flames of the hell of Rotterdam, and the sun I saw through the black gray column of smoke was changed into blood, and it spoke to me. Much has happened, and I could not be silent. Now we wait patiently and sometimes impatiently, for we don't know the future. One day we will have peace again. One day we won't hear the engines of warplanes any longer. One day we will again live freely, lives of happiness and love and Dutch luxury. Maybe then people will acknowledge that neither the one nor the other, but that he rules the world. Bong, 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 I want to shout at them, to shoot at them, those lousy planes, every time they do their pestilent buzzing over the city. I wait for the hour, and that will come, when I can join and march against the enemy to fight for the liberty of Dynica, my fatherland, and myself. You filthy scum and bunch of bloody pus boils, don't you think that you are big heroes now that you have massacred a whole city of people who wanted only peace? Rotterdam calls for revenge, you bunch of boils. From the diary of Hein Sitzma. Maybe it was better that I didn't know Hein was in Rotterdam to experience what he did, such a horrifying, fiery bombardment. Sometime later, I received a card from him saying that he had been near Rotterdam and he had survived. The card had a postmark on it, an advertising stamp that said, Spend your vacation in your peaceful fatherland. The corners of that card were actually smudged from the fires of Rotterdam. The next terrible news we got was that our queen and all of the government officials had left the Netherlands and gone to England. I cannot express how horrible that made us feel. I heard it on the radio. The queen has left for England. Our queen. It was an awful moment because it was as if our mother had left us behind for the Germans. June 4, 1940. And you, Wilhelma, Wilhelmina, and our government, don't you think yourselves a bunch of wonderful people to save your skins elsewhere and to let our men sacrifice their lives? Did you see them fight? Did you see them die? They loved him, and they loved their fatherland and their queen, more even than we who survived. They were so courageous, those trusting, faithful soldiers. Thousands of them fell, do you hear? And thousands also lost everything they had, do you hear? Thousands. And you left for safer regions, did you not? Heroes, you only thought of yourselves, did you not? But the best of the noblest gave their lives, you hear. 
If you ever would come back, then you'll know that the handful of guys who formed the core of our country, the cream of the crop, is gone. From the diary of Ein Sitzma. We were so angry and bitter, we did not know enough then to understand exactly what had happened. It would take some time before we understood why the Queen and the whole government had abandoned us. Those first few days, just before the Germans had actually marched in and taken control, the bank where I worked was nearly overwhelmed with business. People wanted to take their money out. They felt they had to buy food and other material to stock up. Everything was in turmoil. During those five days, there were air raids as well. Whenever there were sirens, we all had to rush into the vaults, which was very scary. The Germans weren't bombing precisely our area of the Netherlands at the time, but we were still very afraid. When the planes came over, we never knew where they would drop their bombs. Later, they did attack The Hague, but I was not there at the time. Then, one day, the tanks rolled into the heart of The Hague. The German soldiers came marching in, doing their goose step, their bright helmets shining. It was simply heartbreaking. Clearer even than the picture of those invading soldiers is my memory of the way tears streamed down my face, down all our faces. There was such a sense of doom, the feeling that it was inev inevitable that the Germans would be ruling us until, somehow, it would be over. That day I became so angry about the Germans, all of this happening in our country, and we hadn't asked for any of it, that I made a vow. Even though I could speak German fluently, I would not speak a word of their language as long as those German soldiers were in our country. After they had taken over, the Germans often came into the bank where I was working, and I had to wait on them. I began my own resistance with a small bit of mischievousness, mischievousness in, the first, in those first days. I knitted a sweater in our royal family's color, orange, and our national colors, red, white, and blue. The background of the sweater was bright orange wool, and I embroidered all over that with red, white, and blue flowers. I wore that sweater to the bank, and there I stood in full view of the Germans standing in line. One day I was called in by the procurat... Uh, this word is very small because it's italicized. Called in by a name I can't pronounce. A holder of the power of attorney, the man who signed the checks. I think it's better if you go home and change into something else, he told me. But he also whispered to me, that he loved the sweater. May 2, 1941. New order of the Reichskommissar. No longer any pictures of live members of the royal family. Von Orange, Nassau, and no longer are we allowed to show the colors of the house? Ridiculous. The love for our royal family remains in our hearts, and you cannot pull that out. From the diary of Diet Amon. After those first few days of the invasion, Hein was brought to Gouda, along with many of our captured troops. I was so relieved when I finally received a card from him indicating that he was all right. But even that was good news was hard for me to celebrate because days before that, in the opening moments of the invasion, my sister had already lost her fiancé. In the face of her terrible loss and the grief of my parents, I could not show my thrill at Hein's safety. Fanny had heard the terrible news about Adrian immediately because when the Germans invaded, she was living in an apartment in Monster, very close to the place where Adrian was shot. The invasion had begun in the early morning hours on Friday, and he was probably killed right away. That day, Fanny did not go to work, but got on her bike and pedaled to The Hague through the military lines. Somehow, she had found out what had happened to Adrian, and she came home to tell the family she was just shattered. It was very difficult to be in our home during those days because of the big shadow Adrian's death cast over all of us. My sister and I shared a bedroom, and I listened to the sound of her sobbing every night. I didn't dare to say a thing to her because I thought I had no right to console her, not with Hein still alive. Adrian's buddy, who was also killed, had been an only child of parents who were not Christians. After the death of their son, they went to seances, and at one point they said to Fanny, Whenever we go, we have regular contact with our son. And you know what, Fanny? Adrian appears to us, too, and he's been asking for you. So my sister went along to those seances for some time. Her face began to take on a ghastly look, big, hollow black eyes. What's more, she lost a lot of weight. To me, the whole thing was sad and very spooky, too. She thought she was talking to Adrian. Have you heard anything strange tonight? She asked me one night. Adrian was here. He came in. His spirit was here in this very room with us. We all watched her suffer as she continued to go to those seances. 
but we couldn't say anything. After all, she was an adult. I was twenty and she was twenty-eight. What can you say to someone that age? She would have been married in September if Adrian had not died that first day of the war. We tried to tell her that seances were wrong, according to the Bible. Remember the Witch of Endor, we'd tell her. But she wouldn't hear of it. She said, Adrian always had one special name for me, a name he used only when we were alone, and he spoke that name to me there, in that seance. When my grandmother came and saw Fanny, she became very frightened. You have to get Fanny out of here, she told Mother, or else she will die. Mother told Fanny that she needed some kind of change, but Fanny wouldn't hear of moving. I'm not going to do anything, she said. I'm not going to look for another job, nothing at all. I believe it, it was her sewing that kept her imprisoned. Sewing was her job, and she was very good. When she did that work with her hands, she would sit there and think and think, because her fingers were busy by themselves. She would sit and twirl her fingers and stay in her despair. Her fingers' solitary work became a refuge, a place to hide. We thought it would be better if she had other kinds of work to do. Finally, Mother said to her, The best thing would be if you were in a household where there is no mother, because you are a terrific housewife. Fanny knew canning, cleaning, and, of course, sewing, and she loved housework. She and I were very much different in our desires. Her highest dream was to have a home of her own. So Mother searched the want ads in the newspaper and found a notice. Widower is looking for a lady to help him bring up his two children in the spirit of the overladen mother, the mother who had passed away. Mother answered that ad and told the man what had happened to Fanny. She didn't tell him about the seances, but she said that Fanny's fiancé had been killed in the invasion and that she needed a change, needed to get out of the house where she was surrounded by all her grief and where everything reminded her of Adrian. So Fanny went to Appledorn, where this man lived, and became his housekeeper. My brother Aryan had already joined the Indonesian service by that time. He later died in a Japanese prison camp. And now Fanny had also left the house where we had lived so happily before the war. Once the Germans marched into The Hague, that house, like so much else in the city, fell into fear and silence. January 1, 1941. What will this year bring us? Peace? Liberty? Reunion? Lord, you know it already. This time last year, when we were all together, we would never have thought that all this would happen, but you knew it, and we still have to give you thanks, for in some way this is necessary for the big plan you have for this world. Lord, you have taken every second of our life in your own hand. Sacred Songs by Rabindranath Tagore, and it has been good. You will take care of us in the future, and therefore a future with you is good. You also see Aryan, who is drawn closer to you because of all this. You see Hein, wherever he may be. You are with them. You look down upon Fanny, for whom this is so very difficult, and you guided her You guided her way to Appledorn. Please grant that for consolation she looks to you only, and not to that contact during the seances, because that appearance would take the place of your Holy Spirit, and Adrian himself would never have wanted this. Lord, you have guided our lives up till now and have been love for us. We thank you for everything you gave us and all we needed. We thank you for the happiness, peace, joy, and now also for our sadness, Lord. Give us for the coming year the certainty that you will always be near us, always hear us, and that your eye will look down upon us in love. Then we can enter this new year with joy. From the diary of Diet Amon. And of course, the next chapter is entitled, The Occupation Begins. One thing I remember reading this is the um, uh, sort of ironic juxtaposition of things like the, the letter where um, Hein um, is trying to have a good attitude and then says, you know, you festering boils, basically. Or lo love the humanness of this, of this book, um, which makes it, uh, I think, more touching as you, as you read. Um, so that's, that's uh, Things We Couldn't Say by Diet Amon. Well worth reading. It's part of our good books guide. I'm going to give a little plug for this again because, um, well, when I'm doing this as a live stream, we have one more day in April. We are doing another book bundle giveaway. And if you sign up for the good books list, you will be entered to win uh, the book bundle, which is uh, over $100 worth of new books taken from here. I think we have 13 books listed in there, uh, brand new. So this, this uh, good books guide is a PDF. We just have a physical copy so you can see what it's, what it's like. Um, 500 books from our team of writers and readers, books that changed us, books that we would call good. And each book has a, a link in the PDF to its page on Amazon. It has a description from the Amazon page, but it also has 
a short paragraph from whoever recommended it uh, about why we think the book is worth reading. So at the very least, list, the very least um, it will give you some ideas for reading if you're looking for something to read. And uh, so you just go to clearwaterpress.com slash goodbooks, as if good books is one word, and uh, enter your email address. You'll get a series of four emails. The first one will have a link to this and uh, four uh, videos that uh, examine worldviews in literature. And um, uh, I wanted to let you know also that we're doing another book bundle uh, giveaway in May. And on my next live stream, I will, I will show you the books that we're going to be doing then. But if you download it tonight, uh, you'll be entered to win both of them. So you're actually, once you download it, you get a ticket for each of the successful book bundles. And um, when you share on social media using the link that you'll get, um, you actually get another ticket. And if someone signs up for it, you get 20 tickets. So that's actually what's happened with the last two uh, book bundles is that people who have shared it uh, more have actually been the ones who have won. So um, yeah, good books guide there. It's free, doesn't cost anything to you guys. And, um, and yeah, I'll end with this, holding this up. Things We Couldn't Say by Deet Iman, worth a read. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks for watching.